Have you heard of the Cantillon effect? Wealth inequality is a well-documented problem in the United States and more broadly across the world. So I think that the wealth gap and the opportunity gap is the biggest issue of our time. This rise in wealth inequality over the past 30 years has to a significant extent been the product of monetary policy fueling a series of asset bubbles. Whenever the market booms, the share of wealth going to those at the very top increases. When that boom goes bust, that share drops somewhat, but then comes roaring back even higher with the next asset bubble. Also, those at the very top are often diversified, so even if their wealth as a group technically goes down due to a stock market crash, for example, as individuals, they are generally fine, and it is the middle class that bear the brunt of the damage. The redistributive effects of money creation were called Cantillon effects by Mark Blog, after the Franco-Irish economist Richard Cantillon, who experienced the effect of inflation under the paper money system of John Law at the beginning of the 18th century. Cantillon explained that the first ones to receive the newly created money see their incomes rise, whereas the last ones to receive the newly created money see their purchasing power decline as consumer price inflation comes about. Following Cantillon and contrary to Fischer and other monetary theorists of this time, Ludwig von Mises was the first to emphasize these Cantillon effects in terms of marginal utility analysis. With an increase in the stock of money, the cash balances of the early receivers of the newly created money increase. Correspondingly, the marginal utility they gave to money decreases and the individuals in question buy either investment or consumption goods, thus bidding up the prices of those goods and increasing the cash balances of their sellers. With this step-by-step -step process, the price of goods will increase only progressively and affect both the distribution of income and wealth as well as the different price ratios. In accordance with the Cantillon effect, inflation can increase inequality depending on the route it takes, but increasing inequality is not a necessary consequence of inflation. If it happened that the poorest in society were the first receivers of the newly created money, then inflation could very well be the cause of decreasing inequality, since they get the money first. However, under modern central banking theory, money is created and injected into the economy via the credit route and first affects financial markets. Under this system, commercial banks and other financial institutions are not only the first receivers of the newly created money, but are also the main producers of credit money. This is because banks can grant loans unbacked by base money. In a free banking system, this credit creation power of banks is strictly limited to competition and the clearing process. Under central banking, however, the need for reserves is relaxed as banks can either sell financial assets to the central bank in open market conditions, or the central bank can grant loans to banks at relatively low interest rates. In both cases, central banks remove the limits of credit expansion by determining the total reserves in the banking system. In other words, the commercial banks and other financial institutions are credited with so-called base money that has not existed before. Thus, the economics of Cantillon effects tells us that financial institutions benefit disproportionately from money creation itself, since they can purchase more goods, services and assets for still relatively low prices. This conclusion is backed by numerous empirical illustrations. For instance, the financial sector contributed massively to the growth of billionaires' wealth, as we can see here. One of the most visible consequences of this growth of financial markets triggered by monetary expansion is asset price inflation. In a completely sound money system where credit only depends on the amount of saving rather than on fiduciary credit, there is very little room for generalized and persistent asset price inflation as the amount of funds which can be used to purchase assets is strictly limited. In other words, the phenomenon of asset price inflation is a child of credit inflation. Asset price inflation predominantly benefits the richest in society for several reasons. First of all, the wealthy tend to own more financial assets than the poor in proportion to income. Secondly, it is easier for the richest individuals to contract debt in order to buy shares that can be sold later at a profit. Since credit easing lowers the interest rate and therefore funding cost, the profits made by selling inflated assets bought at credit will be even greater. Finally, asset price inflation coming with the growth of financial markets will benefit those working in the financial sector, obviously. It will also benefit the CEOs of the publicly traded companies who will be paid more as the market cap of their companies increases. Hence, the correlation between asset prices and income inequality has been, as expected, very strong. 
Despite this, many economists have failed to see asset price inflation as a consequence of an inflated money supply. This oversight leads to the effects of inflation on inequality to be underestimated or ignored. Periods of growing inequality and monetary inflation, such as the 1920s or the 2000s, were associated with a high rate of asset price inflation, but relatively stable consumer prices. Therefore, to just focus on consumer price inflation as the only variable accounting for monetary policy leaves out most of the effects of money creation itself on inequality. And this effect is very clear. Our monetary system itself increases inequality. Perhaps that was the intention all along. For more compounded valuable content, subscribe and like.